how's everybody today? Morning. 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 All right, on Memorial Day weekend, we find ourselves with. Uh, I look out across the room, I see the greatest generation of service that America's ever experienced. So if you're part of that group, give yourself a hand. Um, please thank you. <laughs> and if you're not part of that group, give them a hand. Teachers and principals out there, school's over. No more school zone, amen. Yes. <laughs> and we have a big announcement. We have our official ministerial intern, Ben Giuliano. He is going to teach today. The United Methodist Conference, we have summer interns, and it's a paid position, and uh, we're grateful that he accepted it. Please join me in opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, on this weekend of sacrifice and memories, um, thank you. Thank you for our country. Thank you for the men and women that have protected it for centuries. And uh, please provide some more to protect the future. We lift up uh, our, our city, our county, our country. In this time of um, memory, may we remember what makes America strong and free and that were founded in religious freedom, in one God. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. 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 Uh, a couple of announcements, and now I'm gonna go cook breakfast. Breakfast today, by the way, you bought it, it's French toast, bacon, sunny delight, and scrambled eggs. So. <laughs> um, Pop Church was awesome this week. We had about 30 people throughout the day. Uh, the band was uh, incredible, the music was amazing. Uh, the fellowship was wonderful. If you guys aren't coming out, you're missing out on a fun time. Um, it's just, it's its really not a church service as much as a, it's a music service and fellowship. Amen? Amen? And then I apologize if anybody showed up this Saturday because I was wrong. We sent out an email blast to everybody. It's the first and third Saturdays that we get food feeding Tampa. So it is going to be this Saturday. So please come on out and help us out. Amen? Yes. All right, Pastor David's going to announce the opening hymn. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Rich. We can dismiss you and the breakfast crew. <laughs> Matt Detman, you have to go help Pastor Rich make breakfast, okay? Anybody else? Okay. All right, Jerson, you're, you're excused too. <laughs> this is your chance. Yeah, get one of the good. It's good. Listen, we had so many, we had, I had so much positive feedback from uh, this hymn last week, Pentecostal Power. Uh, that we decided we'd start off with it this morning. So let's all stand up and sing about that Pentecostal power. <laughs>
think of that one. <laughs> okay, let's remain standing as we affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. service where I remind you that we give you all sorts of ways. We provide all sorts of opportunities for you to, uh, to give. Uh, you can drop your offering in the, uh, in the boxes that we provide at the front and the back of the sanctuary. Uh, you can mail them in. You can give online. You can text to give. You can use the church app. And while many preachers this morning in churches across America will be encouraging you to give till it hurts, I want to encourage you to give until it feels good. Yeah. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, thank you, thank you. It feels so good to give. It feels so good to partner with you in all the amazing things, the life-changing, the world-changing things that you are doing. So we thank you for all the offerings that will come in this week. We pray that you'll bless them and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name. Thank you. 
Our next hymn this morning, I want to invite you to make this your prayer. Breathe on the breath of God as we prepare to hear God's word for us this morning. That ruach, that yuma, the breath of God to breathe on us as we prepare to hear his inspired word for us this morning. Let's stand as we sing. So yeah, we are we are so excited to uh, uh, to be a part of the downtown community. Uh, we moved to 882 South Eucalyptus Street. Uh, don't come by and see us this afternoon. We're not quite ready <laughs> for visitors. We're still living uh, among uh, the boxes. But you all know the house as you're coming into town on uh, Lakeview, and there's the Catholic Church. There's the Catholic parking lot. The first street. That is South Eucalyptus Street. You can actually see our house from Lakeview. And I'm super excited. I just, I love this community uh, so much. Our family has come to love Seabrook so much that we just we just want to be a part of it. Um, and, and you know, it's hard, you know, unless, well, it's, it's not hard, but it's hard really to be Seabrook people. Unless you're born and raised here, it's very hard to be Seabrook people. But I really hope now that we have moved to the downtown area and we have moved into a home that was built for St. Frank Sebring in 1926, that maybe, just maybe, we could be adopted Sebring people. If, 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 if y'all will, will let us. So do, do come by. But you know, uh, it is stressful. You, you all know it's stressful moving. And they say that the three top stress-inducing events in a person's life are the death of a close loved one, divorce, and moving house. And I'm here to tell you that number three can cause both one and two. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and we and we came very very close. <laughs> Especially if you're doing it. We yes yeah. But I, but I want to thank all of you who have helped with your support, your kind words, and your prayers in <coughs> practical ways uh, as as well. So. Um, all that's to say is I didn't even think about a sermon until Wednesday, right? I didn't even have time to think about it. And then Thursday, you know, getting out of our house in the country club got really real. And we realized how much was still not packed. And so I got, you know, got swept along or sucked in or however you want to say it into that. Friday, uh, Friday it, it happened. And uh, Saturday... Uh, that was yesterday, right? So we spent the day. That was, we spent the day unpacking, and we made a lot of progress. But all that's to say is, I, I had no more time to think about. It. So I got halfway through the sermon, and I like realized, I there's just no way this is going to happen. Uh, what am I going to do? So I turned to Ben, who is now our <laughs> official summer pastoral ministry intern. And I said, Ben, you know, the conference requires you to preach two or three times. <laughs> I said, would, would, would you take this sermon and finish it? And he said, absolutely, Dad. Okay. So give Ben a big hand. So, so it's, it's chaos. It is absolute chaos in our, in our house right now. And, and you, you mentioned clean clothes. I, don't, I still don't know where my clothes are. I think my clothes are so. There's a cottage. There's a converted garage in the back in the backyard of this house where the big boys now officially live. This is their official residence name. So Henry will be back there. Henry gets here on Monday, I think. I think Mon Monday or, or Tuesday. So they'll be they'll be living. I think my clothes are in a box somewhere out there. But I managed to find a few that match. And that was and that was a miracle. I mean, obviously, poor Theo couldn't find clean clothes. Anymore. So, so the struggle is real in the Juliana house, but we shall overcome. We will, we, we will get through this. So, so, yeah, it is. So, again, just thank you for your support uh, during this challenging, but exciting, very exciting uh, time. And we look forward to you stopping by and. and uh, being guests on home. Now so, we can really say welcome home. Yes, yes I can. Welcome home. So Ben, would you please welcome Ben this morning? He's going to show you. <laughs> so Father, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for my son, uh, the ever uh, smiling, the ever charismatic, the ever anointed uh, Ben Giuliano. And I just pray that you would lay your hand upon him, Lord, and fill him with a double portion of your spirit as he shares the word with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, you know when he gives you the, uh, the sit-down motion right, right before you come up, you know he's about to preach a 10-minute sermon before the sermon. Do I need to get about 10 minutes uh, out of this so you guys can all go home? No, please. Okay. Well, okay, all right, let's go, let's go. Really, all you guys were on fire this morning. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, you know, that, that God you know, that great Jehovah really brings back some memories for me. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar uh, by now uh, with some of the stories that my dad has told and that I have told about uh, being at Kingswood, but, but sort of the tradition is that every school um, kind of over time uh, develops a set of hymns that they absolutely love. And for whatever reason, whenever these hymns are sung in a whole school service, these are the ones, kind of like at church, everybody knows them, and you just belt them out. And so as Burley was playing that, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, I could hear those kids belting, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land, I Am Weak, But Thou Art Mighty. Hold me with that powerful hand. I, I, in fact, that is actually one of my favorite non-Charles Wesley hymns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the very few. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. 
This morning, we're going to continue our series called The Good. And we're looking into God's Word uh, to see what He says about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. If you have your Bibles with you, let's open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And today I want to talk about how the Holy Spirit empowers and enables us as believers with spiritual gifts. You're actually going to have to use your Bibles this morning because I didn't have time to make a sermon slide. <laughs> but I'll read it to you nice and slow so you can keep up. Now, about the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in every one, the same God is at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing by that same Spirit, to another, miraculous powers, to another, prophecy, to another, distinguishing between spirits, to another, speaking in different tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the same Spirit. He distributes them to each one, just as he determines. So let's go ahead and start off with a working definition of spiritual gifts. And then we'll go back and we'll dig deeper into the passage. What is a spiritual gift? If you're taking notes, a spiritual gift is simply a supernatural ability given to all Christians to do God's work on earth. It's an ability given by God to all God's people to make a difference First, if you read scripture, first in the church, and then overflowing into the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll start at verse 1 and then look at verses 4 to 6 to build a foundational understanding. Verse 1, now about spiritual gifts, Paul says, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. And yet, according to one study, 87% of Christians know nothing about their spiritual gifts. Paul says, first off, I don't want you to be ignorant. And yet almost 9 in 10 Christians don't know anything about their spiritual gifts. They're ignorant. Verse 4, Paul continues and says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. The same Holy Spirit gives these different kinds of gifts to believers. Verse 5 says, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works them in all men. In verse 7, the New Living Translation, it says this, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Notice all Christians receive spiritual gifts. All gifts are useful. The devil wants you to keep your gifts hidden and unused, so that the gift the Father has given you is not useful to build up the body of Christ and minister to people in the world. What I want to do today is I want to expose you to a couple of lists that were given in Scripture. But first, let's talk about what spiritual gifts are not, so we can better understand what they are. Now, five things spiritual gifts are not. If you're taking notes, you can jot these down. First, spiritual gifts are not talents. Natural gifts are different from spiritual gifts. When you're born naturally, God gives you natural talents. You may be naturally gifted to sing or dance or be naturally good with numbers. These are natural talents. But when you're spiritually born, you receive spiritual gifts. But God can continue to give you more gifts throughout your walk. Your spiritual gifts can complement your natural gifts, and God can use all of them. 
But this is the natural difference between spiritual gifts and natural gifts. Second, spiritual gifts are not given to the elite few. God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to take this group of Christians that I really like and give them really powerful gifts, and you're going to be the more powerful Christians. And the rest of you, I don't like you that much, so <laughs> you guys can sit in the corner, and you might not even get any gifts at all. These are not for the elite few. They are given to all Christians. Three, spiritual gifts are not a sign of spiritual maturity. If you have a certain gift, it doesn't mean that you're more mature than someone who has a different gift. Sadly, in a lot of Christian cultures today, some people elevate certain gifts. <clears throat> some of you are spiritually mature if you have this gift, and if you don't, you're kind of a lesser Christian. Oddly enough, the gift of speaking in tongues in many church cultures, in, for many Christians, is elevated to be the most important. People in some church cultures who don't speak in tongues they feel like they're second-class Christians. When in reality, the Bible tells us that speaking in tongues is called the least of all gifts. Yet this can be the most divisive in many places. Spiritual gifts are not a sign of spiritual maturity. Fourth, spiritual gifts are also not the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are different from the gifts of the Spirit. If you want to study the fruits of the Spirit, you can go to Galatians 5. There are nine of them. You probably know them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Sometimes Christians will say, well, I don't have the gift of love. I don't have the spiritual gift of patience. No! No! Those are not gifts. They're fruit. They're evidence of what God is doing in all of us. All Christians have those. So all believers should exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. But all Christians do not have all the gifts of the Spirit. These are two different things. Finally, if you're taking notes, spiritual gifts are not something to fear. There is something odd and creepy all though about, you know, sometimes Christians that use spiritual gifts can be a little odd and creepy. <laughs> I, I don't want to be insulting, but just because you see someone that does something you don't understand doesn't mean that the spiritual gift is weird. The Bible says that we should eagerly desire spiritual gifts. So just because you see someone maybe with unusual preacher hair or some church where everyone is, is doing the holy roller thing, you know, boom, 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 they all fall down and you say, that seems weird. Well, you know, honestly, from my perspective, that is a little bit different. Um, I'm not saying that God couldn't knock you down. If God wants to knock you down, he can definitely knock you down. But just to say everyone's got to fall down because that's the way we do church, it could be emotionalism. And sometimes you might go rightly. That seems a little strange. And yeah, it's strange to me too. But just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that the spiritual gifts themselves are strange. We shouldn't let our bad experiences or our uncomfortable experiences inform all of our experience of God and automatically assume that other people are wrong just because they do things different from us. These are gifts given by God for the believer to make a difference in the world. So what I want to do is look at two portions of scripture that talk about spiritual gifts. And here we have four different lists, but we're going to look at two main ones. And I'll tell you the others later if you want to go back and look at them. So what are some of the spiritual gifts? We find them in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. That gives us our first list of spiritual gifts. Here, the Apostle Paul says, In his grace, God has given us, believers, different gifts for doing certain things well. <clears throat> and he lists these seven different gifts. He says, first of all, if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. What is the gift of prophecy? 
It's the ability to speak on behalf of God. If, if you're a pastor, God has given you the spiritual gift of prophecy. In fact, some people might say that what I'm doing right now is prophecy. It's declaring on behalf of God. Others would say it more directly, like the story of that young couple that gave birth to a son. Either way, it's speaking boldly what God has put on your heart. Those are unusual examples. Like, like the couple that my dad met, and in his 20 years of ministry, he's only had about you know, 10 examples where he claimed to speak prophetically into people's lives. But I can also tell you that in all cases, I know that he has spoken against the odds. And each time, I know that God has proven those words of prophecy true. And just another random story from the gift of prophecy. And this one, I, I have a little more uh, experience with. A few years ago, my parents came to see me in England to attend the leadership conference, uh, which we have attended every year since 2017. And during the conference, we met Deb, whom we all quickly befriended and got to know very well. You might remember that she's visited us here in Sebring a couple times. And that week, while we were all in London, we went to a church service together. In the middle of it all, Deb turns to my dad and she says, I think Abba, that's what Deb, uh, that's the word that Deb uses to refer to God. She says, I think Abba has given me a picture for me. She said, you know those trees that they have in Africa? like on safaris. I, I, I think that's what I'm seeing for you. And I think God is telling me, David, that you're going to do ministry in Africa. And my dad's thinking, no way, no how. I'm not going to Africa. That's the last place I want to go. I don't have any connection to Africa whatsoever. And Allison, Deb continued, I just feel like these African children are going to call you mother. Oh, Lord, my dad's thinking. <laughs> Here we go again. We don't need a seventh one. <laughs> Perhaps not in the direction that my dad and I had both feared. <laughs> Only a few short months later, uh, my dad's friend and my friend too, Dr. Wayne Lavender at the Foundation for Orphans, called my dad and introduced him to Fernando Matsimbe. I'm sure Fernando is watching this morning. Yeah. <laughs> and over the last two years, just like Deb prophesied, uh, my dad has partnered with Fernando and partnered with our church and our family here at First Seabrook to build Allison's House of Hope and a school housing 55 children. We've got a bus to take these kids to school. Uh, Fernando is working on gardens and livestock to make the mission center self-sufficient. And we're building the largest church in the Serengeti. And under a plane tree. And on her birthday last year, all the children at Allison's House of Hope gathered to sing Happy Birthday, Mama Allison, to my mom. God's a funny guy. <laughs> he's funny, he's funny, he's not funny. Let's look at a second one. I want you to understand that this is a second gift, and it's just as spiritual as the gift of prophecy. The Bible goes on to say in verse 7, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. Some of you have the spiritual gift of serving. The idea of doing something for someone else, especially when they don't know about it, that's just the thrill of your life. Why is that? Because God has given you the gift of serving. And God has given these to people to live like they serve. That is a spiritual gift. If you're a teacher, some of you have the gift of teaching, and you can't just read something. You go to your Bible, you read it, and you say, I've got to tell somebody. You're like, oh my gosh, here's the Greek word for that, and here's what it means. 
You're getting into all this stuff, and you use that gift to teach God's word in church. If you read on, the Bible says, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. Unleash that thing, man. Let it fly. Anytime you see anything that someone is doing well, be a blessing to them. Write that email. Send that text. Encourage them. That is an important spiritual gift, the gift of encouragement. The next gift says, if, you, if your gift is giving, give generously. This church is so incredibly generous. You've often heard my dad say this. He never has to ask for money. He just lets you guys know the opportunities that are out there, where he sees God working, and you guys always respond. It's like Pastor Rich said last week, we told you that we wanted to feed our Sunday school children a cooked breakfast every week. And soon enough, there was $1,000 ready for that purpose. $1,000 that you had given. And now, I think I'm correct in saying, you guys have fed these kids for just about an entire year. And it didn't even take you a week. The Bible goes on to say that if you have leadership ability, take the responsibility Seriously. Many of you have the gift to lead, but you're not leading anything in the church. Your gun is hidden and it goes unused. If you have the gift to show kindness, the Bible says, do it gladly. This is the gift of mercy, of showing kindness. This is a gift that God has given you to minister to other people. How do you know which gift you have? Well, there are a lot of ways, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, I want to give you my favorite. And it's kind of fun, a kind of funny way of trying to see what gift you have. Some people call it the apple pie demonstration. Imagine you're at a table with a bunch of people, and there's somebody eating apple pie. And their apple pie is on the edge of the table. It's about to fall off. And you see that they're vulnerable, and yet, as they put their fork into their pie, it falls into their lap. What a waste of a good apple pie. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do next? What you think of doing next might help determine what your gift is. How many of you would say, I, I almost told you that was about to happen, you idiot. You shouldn't have done that. I saw it coming. How many of you would do that? If you're not raising your hand, one of those who would do that. I, I know you're in here. You guys have the gift of prophecy. It's not as hard as you think. How many of you, on the other hand, would say, oh man, that's just so unfortunate. Well, here, let, let me help you clean that up. Here's a napkin, let me wipe that up. And we'll, we'll get y'all taken care of. How many of you are like that? That's probably a little easier than the first one. You have the spiritual gift of serving. Some of you might say, but this is probably me. Oh, I've researched this. There's a better way to eat apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> I read an article about this in the New England Journal of Medicine, and you, 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 just, you just got the technique all wrong. <laughs> I'm sure we have some teachers in here, right? <laughs> some of you would go, oh man, oh, that's just so unfortunate. I, I could see it happen in slow motion, and it just really got me right there. But don't worry about it, it's okay. Well, you watch this. And, and you throw it on yourself and you make them feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> you have the gift of encouragement. <laughs> or here, take mine and back bring apple pies for everybody and put whipped cream on it. How many of you would do that? You have the gift of giving. There are those of you who would say, we can get this cleaned up in no time. You go get this, you go get that. I've got a vision to make the situation better. If that's you, you have the gift of leadership. There are those of you who would say, my heart sinks, my heart sank when I saw it falling into your lap. 
I was hurting for you. And I'm just so devastated with what you're going through right now. I can barely even do this. I can barely even speak because I have no mercy at all. I'm like, you idiot, I saw it coming. If you're like that, you have the spiritual gift of mercy and showing kindness. These are the gifts of God that God has given you. He's given us to minister to other believers and to be used in the world. Quite honestly, many of you don't even know what your spiritual gift is, or you do when your gift is hidden and going unused. Let's take a look at another list of spiritual gifts. These are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 7. Here's what the Bible says. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, he gives a message of special knowledge. For some of you, people come to you often because you give great advice. It's like you've tapped into a different level of knowledge and wisdom. <clears throat> and this is a gift that God has given you, and you should use it often. You should be leading small groups. You should be mentoring. You should be available. Because this is the gift that God has given you. The Bible goes on to say in verse 9, the same spirit gives to someone else. The one spirit gives the gift of healing, the gift of faith, the gift of healing. I don't have either one of these. And honestly, sometimes I don't feel like I have great faith. Some of you have the gift of healing. I don't. But I know it's a gift. And when you look around the world, especially outside our country, you see the gift of healing working so much more. I mean, it's supernatural healing. And my guess is because in many parts of the world, they don't have doctors to go to, and so they have to depend on God a little bit more. And also because there's not so much unbelief, I believe there is more of faith. You see supernatural healing going on all over the world today. It's a gift. God. Verse 10 says, he gives one person the power to perform miracles and the other to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Some of you go, you'll, you'll walk into situations and you'll say, I know there's something not right. How will I know? It's a gift. It's a gift of discernment. Paul goes on to say, still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. This is the ability to speak in tongues. While another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. Tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Are these gifts for the church today? Are these real gifts, speaking in tongues? Is this what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Next week, we'll, we'll tackle that and more subjects, what it means to lead a spirit-led life. Verse 11, the Bible says, It is the one and only Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, the Numa, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gifts each person should have. So how do you discover your gifts? The gift that God has given you. Let me give you five quick thoughts. First, study what the Bible says about gifts. Look at it, study it. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4 talks about the five fold gifts of ministry. And 1 Peter 4, read those chapters and study them. Second, ask God to show you your gifts. God, what have you given me? Watch what he does. Watch what he starts to do. Ask him, where do you want me to use these gifts? How do you want me to use them to make a difference? Three, examine what you enjoy and do well. If you're gifted, you're going to enjoy using your gifts, and you're going to do them well. If you say, I, I never want to help anybody, I hate being called on to help, it just makes me really uncomfortable, you probably don't have the gift of serving because you don't enjoy it and you don't do it well. Ask yourself what you enjoy and what you can really do well. 
Fourth, you can take the spiritual gifts test. It's not going to be foolproof. The, the tests are online. If you have the U version app, you can use that. There's a pretty easy one that you can get to, and that's a tool that can be helpful. Five, and most importantly, do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Whenever you feel like God is calling you to do something, have the faith to do it. Just like whenever I feel God has given me a burden to speak on his behalf, the more I do that, the more he proves himself faithful. The more confidence I have that it's a gift from God. I don't own it. It doesn't make me better. It doesn't make me any more inspired or more spiritual than the next person. But it does give me confidence to step out and use these gifts. And so I try to use them to make a difference in the world. Imagine this for a moment. My dad has six kids. Imagine that he loves his kids so much, he's going to like select specific gifts for each child, and he's going to give them a gift to make the most difference in the world. Theo, he's my, he's my dad's oldest child. I'm going to give him this gift. Ben, here's my specially chosen gift for you. Lily, this is what my dad wants to give her, because God is going to use that to make a difference. Imagine as a father, if he had given these gifts to his children at great expense to himself, and they simply put them aside and ignored them. They don't think about them. They don't use them. They ignore the gifts that their father has given them to make a difference in the world. And this is exactly what many of us in the Christian world are doing. You might know what your gift is, but you haven't used it in church ever. But what I want you to know is that the church is incomplete without your gift. The world needs you to use your gift. You've got a gun on the shelf, and it continues to go unloaded. Here's what scripture says. We'll close with this. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. If you have the gift of speaking, then speak as through God himself, as though God himself were speaking. If you have the gift of helping others, do it with all your strength, with the energy that God supplies. I, I, I could go it alone and say, Whatever your spiritual gift is, if it's serving, if it's prophecy, if it's giving, if it's encouraging, if it's mercy, whatever it is, in everything you do, use your gift passionately. The Bible says that everything that you do will be done to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. Don't insult the giver of the gift by leaving your gift undiscovered and unused. God has given all of you who are believers spiritual gifts to make a difference in his church and throughout the world. Uh, this is kind of the end of the, it was supposed to be the end of the talk. And I don't know if you noticed something, but when I was writing this, I, I felt like the talk kind of ended abruptly. Like, like the plane's trying to land somewhere and it just, it, it, it just can't find the right way. It's building to the big conclusion, the main point, and it just stopped. And when I noticed this yesterday, I stopped too. I stopped and asked God out loud. I said, God, it feels like something is missing here. I need your help. I walked away for a few hours, and at 11 p.m., while I was catching up on a few days of the Bible in one year, because I was about three or four days behind, you could all boom me later. I, I think I heard uh, God tell me something, and I, I need you to let me know what I what you think after the service. And, and this verse uh, jumped off the page. It's Proverbs thirteen twelve. It says this: Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. Verse nineteen says it a different way. It says a longing fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but fools detest turning from evil. And if I'm completely honest, I can see that for me and for other people, 
this year has been a struggle. Don't get me wrong. I've had amazing blessing. I'm about to graduate a whole semester early from Florida Southern. I'm about to start working three jobs, each of which I love very much for different reasons. I'm going back to Florida Southern to do an MBA debt-free. I am blessed. But I can also sense for myself, and maybe for other people, that there's a deep pain of a longing unfulfilled that the writer of Proverbs talked to me about. And you know, when I think about my own spiritual gifts, people come to me all the time and say, you're, you're so encouraging, Ben. You're so inspiring. You're the most inspiring person that I've ever met. And, and for me, I really feel like I know my spiritual gift. And I try my best to, to walk in it every day. But there are areas of my life where I feel like my gifts just won't penetrate the way that I want them to. And no matter how hard I try or ask God for that breakthrough, and I think there might be, the reason I'm saying that is because I think there might be others of you out there today. You know what your gift is, but, and you feel like you've been using your gift, walking in your gift for months, years, decades, maybe. But there's just an, an, an area of your life or a context. There's an area of contention, a battlefield, that you're using your gift, and, and, and the battle just won't break for the Lord. You've encouraged others, you've taught, you've led, whatever the case might be, and you've done it for a long time. But you're exhausted and you're waiting for that moment uh, when you can use your spiritual gift in a specific moment in a new or challenging environment with a specific person. And I don't know for sure, but I think God is going to present opportunities for breakthrough this week. And so I wanna pray for all of us that he would give us uh, opportunities of breakthrough with our spiritual gifts. That, that this would be a moment for those of us, you know, if, if we know where our spiritual gifts are, that he would present us with new opportunities. I'm going to pray for that, and then I'm going to pray for all of us as well. Let's pray. God, I pray for those of us this morning who have listened to this talk, and we might know what our spiritual gift is. And, and, and we've been walking in it for a long time. But, but there's a place, it seems, that we just can't quite get it to work. We try it, and it, it seems like nothing happens. God, in the words of the Apostle Paul to the believers in, in Corinth, I call you as my witness that there would be an end to the spiritual blockage because you are the God that works in all times and in all places. Your arm is never too short. I pray that there would be a specific opportunity this week that those of us who have discerned our spiritual gift, gifts can experience that reality. That reality of breakthrough uh, of your Holy Spirit onto new ground that we've been begging you to take using our spiritual gifts that you've given us. And God, I pray for those of us that don't know what our spiritual gifts are yet. Maybe this is the first time we've thought about them. God, I pray in this moment, right now, you would release newly minted teachers, encouragers, leaders, and comforters. Most especially, I pray that the power of your spirit would come on this church in Seabrain, Florida. Release the gifts of prophecy, of speaking in tongues, of interpreting tongues. Release your spiritual power right here, right now. Amen. Did he save my skin or what? <laughs> Thank you. Man. I love this uh, this last hymn. Charles Wesley wrote this hymn for the day of Pentecost. And he says, Lord, we believe to us and ours the apostolic promise given. Go ahead and, and cue that next slide. Lord, we believe to us and ours the apostolic promise given. We wait the Pentecostal powers, the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Wesley says that the day of Pentecost, that was not just some historic event where God acted uniquely once and for all, but he, is, he sees the day of Pentecost as a promise, not just an event, but a promise that is given to all of us and he prays for those Pentecostal powers that came down on the day of Pentecost to continue to be poured out 
on his church over and over again and again. That's what this hymn is about. So let's stand up and sing, Lord, we believe to us in you.